story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A socially prominent citizen is plotting to kill his wife. He tells you his plans for the murder. He hires you to do the killing. Your job, stop him. When you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke extra mild Fatima. Fatima is the quality, king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. You'll find king-size Fatima different from other long cigarettes. They cost the same, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Smoke Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, February 17th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 4.18 p.m. when we got to room 26, chief of detectives' office. Come on in, men. Have a seat. Did you close the door, Friday? Yeah, sure. Captain Steed, Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. I'd like to have you meet Special Agent Ray Kimball, Public Utilities Commission. Oh. Hi, Mr. How Kimball. Do you do, Mr. Kimball? And his friend, Mr. Trudeau. How do you do? Mr. Trudeau. Oh, yes, sir. Gentlemen, Mr. Kimball and Mr. Trudeau here have some important information to give us. Mr. Trudeau, would you like to repeat for these officers what you told us a few moments ago? Yes, sir. Well, a friend of mine wants me to kill his wife for him. I'm convinced he means to go through with the thing. Naturally, it goes without saying that Kimball here will back up the veracity of the story. Well, Mr. Trudeau, who is your friend? How long have you known him? His name's Charles Stone. I guess maybe you heard of him. Owns a string of warehouses around town. I used to work for him. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, the other day he called me and asked me if I was working. I told him no. Then he asked me to meet him in front of the public library. And that was last Saturday afternoon. But did you meet him? Uh, yes, I did. And he took me to a bar in the neighborhood, started telling me all about his troubles at home. Mm -hmm. He said his wife was stepping out on him, running around with other men. Well, we had quite a few drinks, and I guess I thought that's what accounted for it. What's that, Mr. Trudeau? Well, he leaned toward me, and he said, here's the dope. The wife and I haven't been getting along well at all for about a year. She's stepping out with some other guy on me, and to make a long story short, well, that's when he told me. Yes, sir. He said... I want to lose her. What do you say? Well, I told him I didn't quite get the drift of the thing, and then he said, I want my wife killed. I'll pay you $1,000 for the job. Mr. Trudeau, have you any idea why he contacted you on this thing? Well, I don't know, other than the fact that I hadn't been able to work for some time. He knew I needed the money pretty badly. As soon as I was sure he wasn't kidding about the murder, I told Mr. Kimball here, he's an old friend of mine. Yeah. He said the only thing to do was to take it to the police. Did this Mr. Stone make this proposition to you more than once? Yes, he did. He kept reminding me how much I could use the $1,000. Well, all I could say was that I knew his wife too well. I couldn't do it. And what did Stone say to that, sir? said I had cold feet. Told me I was just like another man he'd lined up to kill his wife. Told me if I didn't want the job, he'd get someone else to do it. Do you think he might go for a substitute, Mr. Trudeau, one of our men? Well, I don't know, Chief. Was... Only one thing I'm sure of. Yes, sir. He wants his wife dead. 
4.42 p.m., the meeting in the chief of detectives' office went on. A man by the name of Charles Stone wanted his wife murdered. He'd offered $1,000 for her death. He'd approached two men to do the job, and both had refused. From the information we'd received, we knew he wouldn't stop there. There were a lot of people who'd kill for $1,000. It was only a matter of time till he found one. A plan was formulated, and Ben and I were assigned to the case. 5 p.m., together with Captain Steed and Mr. Trudeau, we left Thad Brown's office and went down the hall to homicide. In your last meeting with Stone, Mr. Trudeau, you refused outright to have anything to do with this plan to have his wife murdered. Is that right? That's right. Did you leave any opening at all? Well, just to get away from the guy, I told him if I heard of anybody that would do the job, I'd let him know. You think that maybe he'd listen to you if you went back and suggested somebody? Well, I don't know. He'd listen to me, but he's no dummy. You've got to understand that. He's going to be careful. Mm -hmm. Well, which one of you is going to play the killer? I'd like to try it, Skipper. Who's going to fit the part best? Trudy here just told you that Charles Stone's no pushover. Uh, I don't know, Captain. This uh, officer here... Me? Yeah, no offense, but I'd sure peg you for a cop. You would? Why is that? Well, I don't know. You just look like one, I guess. Well, Joe is a little closer to average height, weight. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean, Captain. He doesn't look like a cop. All right. Now, uh, Mr. Trudeau, you're willing to go along with us on this thing? Certainly, Captain. Anything I can do. You just tell me what you want. Well, just as soon as possible, we'd like to have you contact Mr. Stone. Uh, you'll know how to approach him so as not to make him suspicious. Yes, I think I can do that. Joe, how do you want to go about this? Well, I'd better use some kind of an alias. Let's see, uh, Matson, Joe Matson. Mm -hmm. How about Kelly? Just plain Kelly. That's fine with me. Good. Now, how about your background? Uh, better get that straight with Mr. Trudeau here. Well, I suppose I tell him I'm from Phoenix, huh? Mm -hmm. If I know that town pretty well, he might ask me some questions about it. Okay. Now, how'd you happen to know Trudeau, the Army? Did you ever serve in the Army, Mr. Trudeau? Yes, sir. 42 to 45. CBI did it. All right. Well, we served together in the Army, huh? Let's make it in China. Mm -hmm. Quartermaster Corps, all right? Mm -hmm. All right. And now, Mr. Trudeau, this is all you'll have to do. Set up a meeting with Stone as soon as possible. Introduce Friday as the man who's willing to do the job for him, an old Army friend. Then step out of the picture as quickly as you can. All right, Captain. I understand. It goes without saying. We certainly appreciate your cooperation. And not at all, sir. Only glad I'm in a position to help out. You we'll probably saved that woman's life. I wish I could be sure. How do you mean, Trudeau? The last time I saw Charlie Stone was three days ago. Maybe he's hired somebody else. <laughs> Five thirty p.m. Captain Steed ordered two teams of men from Homicide to watch Charles Stone's wife, Mildred, until further notice. For her own protection, she'd be kept under twenty-four hour surveillance without her knowledge. We checked the I Bureau to see what we could find on Charles Stone. He owned a gun, a thirty-two Smith and Wesson revolver. That's all we found. He had no criminal record. We knew of him only as a social figure from a prominent family, and supposedly he was happily married. He owned and operated a chain of six warehouses throughout Los Angeles. His business reputation was good. Captain Steed ordered that Charles Stone also be placed under 24-hour surveillance immediately. He would be kept under watch without his knowledge. Ben Romero and Gil Encinas were one of the teams assigned to tail him. The next morning, I checked in for work at the usual time. At 10.15 a.m., I left Captain Steed's office and went into the squad room. Homicide, Friday. This is Mr. Trudeau, Sergeant. I saw Charlie Stone a few minutes ago. Yes, sir. How'd it go? We talked about 20 minutes. I told him you might be willing to do the job. What'd he say? He wants to meet you. Before he hung up, Trudeau told me that Charles Stone would meet us that night in Section B in the grandstands at the Midget Auto Races out near Santa Monica. I informed Captain Steed of the development, and then I left the office, went home, put away my gun and all my identification, changed into some old clothes. I boarded a bus and rode back downtown to the Skid Row area where I rented a single room in a cheap hotel. I signed the register J. Kelly, Phoenix, Arizona. 5.30 p.m., I went to Kogan's Cafe on the corner of South Main and Satella Streets. Captain Steed was waiting for me in one of the rear booths. Hi. Hi. You look like you're all set. Yeah, how does the outfit strike you, okay? Yeah, fine. That old leather jacket's a good touch. Oh, uh... Better let your beard grow a little. You all right? I rented a room in one of the hotels down here. I could use a little expense money. Mm. Glad you said a little. All right, I'll fix it up for you. Uh, here's the phone number of the hotel in case you want to contact me. Good. The one thing that's got me a little worried, Skipper. Yeah? The legal angle. You know, you can get pretty close to entrapment in cases like this. Well, nothing to worry about. You just play it straight down the line. Yeah. 
The idea for the crime has to originate in the mind of the criminal. It's got to be all his idea. Mm -hmm. You just go along with him. Okay. Be sure and keep us posted. Yes, I will. Murder of his wife means a lot to Stone. He wouldn't want anybody getting his way. Yeah. Be careful. That night, I had dinner with Trudeau at a cafeteria on South Grand. And then we caught a bus and rode out to the stadium where they held the midget auto races. We found the seats where Charles Stone was to meet us. Numbers 4 and 5, row 27, section B, main grandstand. The auto races started. At 10 minutes past 8 p.m., Charles Stone arrived. He looked like an average, prosperous businessman, well-dressed, medium build, dark hair that showed a few streaks of gray. Trudeau introduced us, and then he left. Where are you from, Kelly? Phoenix. You like midget auto races? That's not why I came out here. Trudeau said something about a job. Sure. Guess he told you what it's about. Yeah. You ever handle anything like this before? I'd be a sucker to answer that one, wouldn't I? I just want to know if you could handle it. Trudeau told me about it. I wouldn't be here if I couldn't handle it. It's a delicate job. Got to be sure it's done right. What are you looking for? References? Got to be careful, that's all. Well, what about me? I don't know you from Adam. How do I know it won't be a double cross? Don't worry about a double cross. Let's go below the grandstand. Get away from this crowd. All right with me. You haven't said anything about money yet. Plenty of time to talk money. I'd like to know. How much you want? Trudeau said a thousand. Yeah. When could you get it? When would you want it? Before. I'd be a dope to do the job without getting paid first. I'd be just as stupid to give it to you first. Say, uh, can I buy you a hot dog, cold drink? Okay. Miss? Yeah. One hot dog, a couple of root beers? One dog, two beers. You like root beer? Sure. How about settling on the dough, huh? You do the job, you'll get paid. You can ask Trudeau if you like. He'll tell you I keep my word. Well, it's got to go fast, that's all. I may have a job lined up in Phoenix. I got to get that dough and some new clothes. Got to put up some kind of a front. That's why I need the dough fast, no waiting. You'll get your money. We can work out something. Hot dog, two root beers, 40. Mustard's on the counter. Hmm. There you are. Just mm-hmm. move over there out of the way. Okay. But you haven't told me yet. What? How do you want it done? All depends. I haven't got my gun. I'm on the lamb. Have you got one? No, I don't own one. Couldn't use a gun anyway. Too much noise. Well, make up your mind. We'll meet tomorrow night. We can talk about it then. Look, mister, you expect me to sit on this thing for a week? I'm not making a career out of just this one job. What are you worrying about? We'll set everything up tomorrow night. All right, how about ten bucks on the cuff? I gotta live them flat. Well, there's five. See if that'll do. All right. Now, how about that payoff, the thousand? How do we set that up? We can talk about that later. Why can't we talk now? Look, Stone... I don't think I like your attitude. You haven't told me how you want the job done. You talk cute every time the payoff's mentioned. Take it easy, Take it easy, nothing. I'm taking the chances. How do I know I'm going to get paid? How do I know you'll kill her? Before I left Charles Stone, we set up a meeting for the following night at 8 o'clock. I caught a bus and went back to the hotel room. So far, I'd been unable to get any other corroborative evidence on Stone, evidence that could be presented in court. The next morning, I called the office and kept them posted on developments. I had my meals at a lunch counter next door to the hotel, and I stuck pretty close to my room. At 2.30 that afternoon, Ben called. We tailed Stone to the midget auto races last night, Joe. Do any good? Well, not bad. It's going a little slow, though. We tailed him after he left you. He drove to a Beverly Hills address, apartment house. Thought he lived in Glendale. He does. The apartment he went to is registered to a uh, Gene Howard. Stayed till four this morning. Check the hard girl out. She's a secretary at one of Stone's warehouses. Oh, maybe that explains why Stone wants to get rid of his wife, huh? Here's one more thing. We tailed him to a gun shop this morning. Bought a couple of things, and after he's gone, we checked with the store clerk. Told us Stone bought a box of shells, 32 caliber. Same kind of gun he had registered in it, 32 S and W? Yeah. That's funny. Stone told me he doesn't own a gun. Doesn't look too good in my book. All right, now let's don't start worrying, huh? Don't trust him a dime's worth, Joe, that's all. All right. You want to check with me later on? I've got to keep this line open. Yeah, all right. See you 
Yeah. This is Stone. Yeah. Job's all set up, ready to go. When? Four night. <laughs> are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. If you smoke a long cigarette, it will be in your interest to listen to a typical case history of a Fatima smoker. It's the case of New York cover girl Rita Daigle. This is her actual signed statement. I find Fatima different from other long cigarettes. They cost the same, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. And they're extra mild. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy king-size Fatima yourself. You will find king-size Fatima different from other long cigarettes. They cost the same, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. <laughs> Wednesday, February 19th, 8.55 p.m. Charles Stone picked me up in his car at the corner of Alameda and 6th Streets. He turned onto South Broadway and he headed down for the beach. He hunched over the wheel as he drove. I kept wondering how I was going to pin him down. We were less than 24 hours away from the scheduled murder of his wife and I still didn't have a case against him that would stand up in court. If he failed to produce sufficient evidence tonight, Stone had a good chance of going free whether he succeeded in having his wife killed or not. I also had no idea what plans the suspect had made before he hired me to do the killing. There was a definite possibility that he might have arranged for somebody else to commit the actual murder and then set up a double cross with me as the victim. We knew he had a 32 s and revolver registered in his name, but he denied to me that he even owned a gun. 9.03 p.m., we pulled up in front of Stone's beach house. Most of the other homes around here are vacant, summer places. People don't start moving in until 1st of May. But you said you're afraid of the neighbors seeing you here. There's some living up the next block. Oh. Can't afford not to be careful. This one here. There's the front door key. See if you can work it. I know how it works. You go ahead and open it. All right. The living room, huh? Yeah, bedroom's over here, through this door. Uh-huh. All right, what's the story? Where do I start? My wife should be here about 6 o'clock tomorrow night. She'll be coming down alone to get the house ready for a weekend party. When do you want me here? About 4 in the afternoon. Here. Here's the key to the front door. Better pick it up and hand it to me, huh? Okay, here you go. First thing you do when you get here is pull out all the drawers in the bedroom bureau, scatter things around, make it look as much like a burglary as you can. Yeah. Same here in the living room. Desk drawer, table, cupboards. Turn them inside out, throw things around. Leave my fingerprints all over everything? Well, I've taken care of that. A pair of gloves of mine. You'll find them here in this drawer, remember that. All right. Let's see now, uh... Oh, yeah, sash cord. I'm sure this ought to serve the purpose. Shouldn't have any trouble. Yeah. Piece of rope's pretty new. It's a little slippery. Won't be with the gloves on. She's not very strong. Shouldn't have any trouble. We'll leave the rope here in the closet. You sure she's going to be alone? Positive. Where am I supposed to hide? Let me show you. Here, right by the front door. This closet. Yeah. My wife comes in, closes the door. She'll probably go right to the bedroom and take off her coat. Follow her in, then do it fast while her back's turned. No screams. Neighbors might hear. All right. Want to clean and quiet. Do it as quickly as you can. Now, when you're finished, here's what I want you to do with her. What's that? Take the body and bring it this way. Come here. Come here. I want you to see 
All right. Across the living room to these French doors. Open this one. You won't have any trouble. Take the body out here on the porch. Come with me now. I want you to get this clear in your mind. Yeah, I think I got it. Take her down to this end of the porch. Right to the railing. Leave her here. It's very important. You understand? All the way down to the end of the porch here. I don't get it, but I guess it's all right. All right, let's go back in. Uh, look, Stone, I may forget the layout of this house here. Could you draw a floor plan for me? I don't want to get mixed up here. No, there's paper in the desk there. You can draw it yourself before you leave tonight. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Can't afford to take any chances. Now, what was it? Uh, yeah. After you're finished using the rope, I mean. Yeah. You'll find some rings on my wife's fingers. Take them all off. Big setting, especially. There'll be a bracelet on her left wrist. Take that, too. What'll I do with them? Put them in this white vase on the mantel here. The rings and the bracelet. Don't miss any of the rings. They're expensive. Well, how about me bringing them to you? I can pick up my dough at the same time. No, put them in the vase. As soon as that's done, leave here and go back downtown. I'll pick you up where we met tonight. Six in Alameda. 7.30 sharp. Have the money for you then. Where are you going to be at 6 o'clock? I have to cover myself. I'll stay on at the office. Special conference. I don't know. I don't think I like this. What do you mean you don't like it? Suppose something should happen. I got no protection. I'd feel a lot better with a gun. I told you I don't have a gun to give you. Why would you need one anyway? Just feel a lot better, that's all. Buy one if you want. That's your problem. I'm paying you for the job. I haven't seen your money. I told you. When the job's done, you get your money then. There's just one thing I want to make sure of. No mistakes here. Don't worry. You get your pay. Ask Trudeau if you like. He'll tell you you can trust me. You can ask anybody. How about your wife? Before I left Charles Stone, I got one more valuable piece of evidence out of him. A special phone number written in his handwriting on the back of one of his business cards. In case anything went wrong, I was to call him at this number. In his own handwriting, I also got a list of times that I was supposed to remember. When to come to the house, when to leave, when to meet him for the payoff. The next afternoon at 3.30, I left the hotel and drove my car out to Venice to Stone's Beach House. Captain Steed and another officer from Homicide followed me out. We waited in the house together. Shortly before 6 p.m., Mrs. Mildred Stone arrived with Biff, Ben, and Gillen Sinus. She refused to believe the story of her husband's plot to have her murdered. Captain Steed laid out the evidence for her. This key, Mrs. Stone, you recognize it? Well, yes, it's the one for the front door. It must be Charles. He gave it to this officer, Mrs. Stone, the man who was supposed to murder you. No, I don't believe it. Do you have any idea what's in that closet, ma'am, that one over there? There's nothing in there. I cleaned it out the last time we were here. I cleaned out all the closets. I'd like to show it to you, ma'am. Piece of rope? I never saw that there before. Mr. Stone gave it to me. It was supposed to be the murder weapon. Just one more point, ma'am. Over here, please. Do you know what's in this drawer here? empty. It has to be. We never keep anything in there. Only when we move down for the summer months. Joe. Right. A pair of your husband's old gloves. Is that right, ma'am? Well, why would they be there? What for? I was supposed to wear them while I was in the house so I wouldn't leave fingerprints. Do you, do you mind if I sit down? Here you are. I'm sorry, Mrs. Stone. We know it's a terrible shock for you. I think you realize we had to tell you. It's all right. You've been very kind. You saved my life. I'm sorry now that happened. Would have been better if he'd succeeded. Much better. Take it easy, Mrs. Stone. The shame. Terrible, terrible shame. Is there anything I can do for him? He wanted to have you murdered, ma'am. I know that. He wanted me dead. Yes, ma'am. There's only one thing. Yeah? He's my husband, Sergeant. I love him. p.m. I telephoned Charles Stone and told him the job was done. His wife was murdered. He said he'd meet me at 6th and Alameda Streets for the payoff as scheduled. I waited. He failed to show up. At 7.30 p.m., Stone was placed under arrest as he parked his car in front of their Venice Beach house. A loaded 32 caliber revolver was found in his pocket. He was taken back to the city hall, the chief of detective's office. Ben and I waited outside the open door. We could hear Thad Brown start the interrogation inside. Do you know what we have you down here for, Mr. Stone? No, I haven't the faintest idea. What would you say if I told you your wife had been murdered? I think you're crazy. What would you say if I told you that you're accused of her murder? It's silly. It's ridiculous. I've been at work all day. I can prove it. 
All right, Friday, come in. Yes, sir. You ever meet this man before? I've seen him on Skid Row. I don't know him. Do you recognize the man you hired to kill your wife? I didn't know the man. I didn't kill my wife. I don't understand all this. The name's Kelly, Mr. Stone. He's some fake officer. He's a Skid Row bum. I don't know him. I don't think that's going to make it, Stone. Both you and your wife have been tailed constantly for the last couple of days. Photographs taken. Midget auto races. Sixth and Alameda. Beverly Hills apartment. Crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Mike, would you send the lady in, please? Mildred, you don't believe all these things you're saying about me, do you? Here are the rings, Charles. The bracelet, too. I didn't realize how much you wanted them. Well, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I don't know what I was thinking of. (laughs) There, Charles. There, it's all right now. You'll feel better in a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. That's all, Friday. Right. What's it look like, Joe? He's starting to talk. It's got me. He tries to have her murdered. She goes to bat for him. What's it prove? He sure must love him. What do you think? How about a cup of coffee, huh? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. To the working detective, the difference between guilt and innocence is proof in the form of physical evidence, in the form of testimony gathered from reliable witnesses. In determining any suspect's guilt or innocence, the difference is actual proof. Now, when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes, the difference is quality, and Fatima is extra mild. If you're a long cigarette smoker like I am, smoke Fatima. You'll find Fatima different from other long cigarettes. They cost the same, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Charles Farnsworth Stone was tried and convicted on soliciting the commission of a felony, two counts. He received the sentence as prescribed by law. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Hi, folks. This is Bob on the air for Chesterfield. Every Tuesday night, consult your local paper for Time and Station Hope. And Bing, on the air for Chesterfield every Wednesday night, Crosby. I've called this little seminar to teach our new boy the ropes. Say, Sag, I think it's only fair to warn you, with me selling Chesterfields this year, you'll have to limp along lively to keep up. Oh, say, since when have you been any competition, lover boy? When, when we're in pictures together, who always gets the girl? Which only backs up the old saying, everybody loves a fat man. Seriously, friends, Skin Flint and I, we do agree 100% on this. Chesterfields are milder. And they leave no unpleasant aftertaste. So always buy our cigarette, Chesterfield. The best cigarette for you to smoke. Hear Hope and Crosby Tuesday, next We the People on NBC.